So, you know, the, and the idea was to walk across the crossing, and I showed up that day with Yuri Montague, and so, uh, it was so hot. So this started some rumor. He's dead. <laughs> is, is it him or a very good double? Well, that was the idea. That was the other part of it, that there was a guy who looked like you taking your place. No, well, this is him. Yeah. Shaftesbury Street 37, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Now there's a KFC. But back in 1848 this was the home of Alison and Ferdinand de Montague. Although very little is known about the young Harry, it's believed that he was born here on the 10th of June, in the year 1948, just after the Second World War. As a kid. Harry never had a lot of friends, as can be seen on this picture taken in 1952 on some abandoned playground. He wasn't very popular as a college student either, due to his orange coloration and his funny looking strange green hair. But that was about to change. January the 15th, 1958, and something special was in the air that day. Belfast, 1958, the 50s was a decade of affluence. And for the first time in history, Northern Ireland had qualified for the World Championships football in Sweden. The whole nation was in a state of euphoria. And they wanted some sort of mascot. Something or someone who would scream and cheer them throughout the tournament. In the end, they would make it to the quarter-finals. And for the first time ever, they go to the final round of the World Cup. It was probably the highlight of my life, really, in football. Uh, going to the World Cup with Harry. Well, and a good pass there by McFarland, but of course it must be it. for us all and not only it was a big deal for everyone it was quite an achievement qualifying for the world cup for northern ireland well, our techniques of all was being to equalize before the other team scored i think they scored first and then we equalized but we equalized the second time before they scored Eventually we died in the quarter-finals, uh, we had a number of injuries and we just, just couldn't put the, the full team that we'd have liked to have put in the field, the boys who did play done their very best, but we couldn't have done it without Harry. And although they were beaten 4-0 by France, the whole nation welcomed them as true heroes. And Harry was one of them, was one of them, was one of them. Harry had it all. He opened stores, restaurants, where there was something to celebrate, he was there. He became so popular, that he even got his own TV commercial. Another classical piece, by Tyrone Crystal. Do you already have one? Just imagine what it must be like, having your own Harry. 
to cuddle, to squeeze, or just to take him anywhere you want. For only 15 pounds, he sweet Caroline's you everywhere and anytime you like. Your own personal Harry in stores now. now. Here's Tom In 1959, Harry joined the Ulster Unionist Party. And to everyone's surprise, they wanted him as their new leader. He had become so popular, that it was almost certain that he would become the nation's new Prime Minister. But then, it all, went terribly wrong. We worship the same God, but the principles of our faith are different. 500 years after the Reformation, there are still painful divisions between prophets and cats. And I f Good morning, this is Fiona McFarlane for BBC Radio 2. Here with me this morning is Governor Mr. Alistair Norton from Labour. Mr. Norton. Good morning. Good morning. What is your opinion on Harry's yesterday night quotes on Ulster TV? Well, in our opinion, it's absolutely intolerable and immoral, certainly in his position, to say things like that on TV. What could be the consequences of all this, you think? It's hard to say, really hard at this point in time, but this can definitely not be tolerated, and measurements will absolutely be taken. Exactly what kind of measurements do you have in mind? Well, I am unable to tell you now, but there's going to be a press conference at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Then it will all become clear. Thank you, Mr. Norton. My pleasure. For BBC Radio 2, this was Fiona McFarlane. Back to the studio. Yet again, Harry had made the headlines. It was the last time they would see him. What a um, idiot. That miserable little bag of jokes. They're all going to laugh at you. Fuck off. Go away, bitch. Until 1959, Harry was one of the most popular names in the nation. Now, nobody knew where he was, or where he had gone, and it wasn't until August 1965 when a camera first caught a glimpse of Harry again. Or, or did they? <laughs> Harry showed up again in 1968. All of a sudden, this video clip was broadcasted on American TV. The single Save the Land We Love made it to number 16 in the American Billboard Hot 100. All went quiet again. Until September, later that same year. At one of Harry's life shows, suddenly no one less than Beatle John Lennon joined him on stage. That's it, John. I'd like to thank the boys for having me on tonight. We tried to think of a number to finish off with so that I could get out of here and be sick. And we just about know it. Yeah. One, two, three, four. The Beatles were in the middle of recording their Abbey Road album, so John Lennon went back to London and decided to take Harry along with him. Harry had written a few songs which John Lennon liked very much, and one of them was Harry's Silver Hammer, 
which can be heard on this rare recording. My last mistake was entirely when I just took my mind off it for a second. Oh, yeah. Okay, carry on. People wonder if Harry will go along with us. Well, we have the footage. No, Harry will keep bumbling along with us when we're on Veronica. More went. So. Yeah, right. But you know, in the end, the way it all ended wasn't very nice at all. It all just lasted way too long, same as it always was. And it probably never changes, changes, changes.